Hi. So this is just a quick extra video, um, which I thought I'd uh, run by a few few ideas that uh, inspired a little bit by the discussion that we had last week. I thought it was a very interesting and great discussion we had. And um, one of the things that came through, one of the things we talked about quite a lot, was this sense that a lot of you have, it's a little sad, I suppose, of this anxiety about reading, and anxiety about reading literature in particular. And we talked a little bit about um, what might be the sources of that. Um, I blame school in part, the notion that school tells you that there's a right way and a wrong way to read. And I'm not entirely sure that that's the most helpful way to think about things. I mean, when we tell kids, when small kids start reading, they get picture books or whatever, there's no right or wrong way, right? They use their imagination. They've got pictures of, I don't know, the Gruffalo or whatever it is, the Hungry ha ca Caterpillar. And uh, there's not a right way or wrong way to read the Hungry Caterpillar. It's all about right what they do with that, right? About the way in which it feeds their imaginations, for instance. Now, we might be reading a little bit differently from small kids, but um, perhaps we should return to something of uh, the way in which kids read and thinking of the way in which Proust is also trying to recover a child's perspective, um, it wouldn't hurt us to do the same. So I want to suggest that instead of uh, a right or wrong reading, we accept that all our readings are going to be misreadings in some ways. They're all going to be wrong to one extent or another. And um, uh, why might be better or more interesting to think about a strong reading, a strong misreading versus a, a weak misreading. There's something in Proust already about that. Um, there's a, a part of uh, the first section in which we hear about how the narrator's mother reads to the narrator, and uh, she skips. She skips bits of the text. Specifically, she skips all the love scenes, for instance, which makes the text a little bit more difficult to follow. And he says, so the narrator says that, um, that this is page uh, 42, if my mother was an unfaithful reader, she was also, on the, in the case of books in which she found the inflection of true feeling, a wonderful reader for the respect and simplicity of her interpretation, the beauty and gentleness of the sound of her voice. So you can be, you can be a, an unfaithful reader, betraying the text in some sense, but at the same time a wonderful reader. So let's try to become not right readers, correct readers, faithful readers, but instead good readers, wonderful readers, which isn't about getting the text right or not. So this notion of a strong or a mis uh, or a weak misreading uh, comes a little bit comes from a guy called Harold Bloom, who was a, a literary critic and, and theorist, and he wrote a book, one of his first books called Anxiety of Influence, in which he looks at um, writers in the English tradition, British tradition in particular, Milton and Wordsworth, for instance, and suggests that um, any writer has to deal with the great writers of the past. And one way is in which they do that, one of the ways in which they do that is by producing strong misreadings, which enable them to create, to produce something new. Again, there's something in Proust about that as well, right? In Proust, again, just a few uh, pages on from uh, that same scene in which we have the mother reading to the child. Uh, he's talking about uh, memories, this, this part of the Madeleine scene, and uh, the question of when the mind has to seek. But he says, seek, looking into the past. Not only that, create. It is face to face with something that does not yet exist and that only it can accomplish them, bring into its light. So even memory, even this recollection, not simply about finding and being faithful to whatever happened in the past, but creating something new uh, from the past. So a strong misreading, a good reading, a wonderful reading, might be that which is most creative. I think we see that in lots of different ways. The power of error, perhaps, right? The power of mistakes. We see that in writing, as Harold Boone suggests. We see that in uh, language change, in the production of new languages. We talked about this a little bit um, last time, but the ways in which the ro Romance languages come out of Latin, in part they come out of Latin through a series of mistakes or errors that take hold and become something new. So, um, you know, speakers start dropping the last consonant, for instance, of words, 
uh, of nouns. This is one of the changes that goes from classical Latin to vulgar Latin and onto the uh, Romance uh, languages. And, and, and some of these changes, some of these, what was strictly speaking, errors or, or linguistic mistakes serve to be the foundation of a whole set of new languages, French, Italian, Romanian, Catalan, Portuguese, and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, these are all founded on these changes, which initially are uh, errors or mistakes or unfaithful or wrong or um, uh, which go against right, the grammar or the so-called rules of the of the master language of the language of Latin. We might also finally think of the pandemic that we've been uh, seeing in its various waves over the last year and a half, the way in which these new mutations come about, right? A new mutation like Delta or Omicron is where in the replication, in the copying of the virus, mistakes are made. And this happens all the time. Um, this this replication, this viral replication is, is always sort of lossy, as, as they say, or is always uh, imperfect, or very often imperfect. But sometimes some of these mistakes, some of these uh, errors in, in reduplication and copying the virus uh, come to be immensely powerful. The new version of the virus uh, comes to have certain strengths, for instance, in evading uh, existing immune responses um, that the previous versions didn't. And that's what we got. That's how we get these these new waves, these new forms like Alpha and Delta and now uh, Omicron, which displace the previous forms of the virus, just as the Romance languages displaced the previous forms um, of, uh, of language. And just as writers try to displace the um, uh, canonical writers and who, who's, whose work they're dealing with and, and uh, inheriting, but also trying to supplant. In some ways, as readers, we're also trying to do the same, right? We're trying to deal with these names, these figures uh, like Proust, but not being, trying to be overwhelmed, overwhelmed or overawed by them, but trying to do something interesting and productive with them, which may not be the most faithful reading. It may be a misreading, but our aim is to produce strong rather than weak misreadings. That's what we're trying to do. Okay, see you in class.